Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's FS Club webinar. Uh, we're calling in here from London, but we're absolutely delighted to use the powers of video conferencing uh, to have some folks here from uh, Lee is uh, dialing in from Hong Kong, Gavin from Scotland, uh, and Kartik and Arelia here in the UK. So great to see everybody here. And today's topic is how to achieve the perfect delivery. Uh, which will be explained anon. Uh, one of the great things about uh, this is a really deep exploration of some of the issues involved with customer service, but also how to handle uh, fraud and money laundering. And today's experts are, I think, going to really help us. Now, you'll know me. I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zien. And it really is a privilege to introduce so many of these FS Club webinars because our sponsors allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. And today's session uh, certainly covers all three of those areas as we're going to be looking at some fascinating applications of technology in areas of finance where we really need to achieve that perfect delivery. Uh, we can only do this, as I say, with our sponsors, including Feature Space, and we're delighted that they're helping us with today's webinar, which therefore leads to a slightly different format. Uh, I'm going to get out of the way as quickly as possible so that you can hear from our experts. Uh, Arali Asame is going to chair or moderate uh, the next 25 minutes, uh, where Lee, Gavin, and Kartik will share their experiences, and then we'll move as ever into a fairly dynamic question and answer session at 11.30. So three points. Uh, one, the slides uh, will be available and are available online, I think, already. Uh, secondly, the, this is being recorded, and the recording will be up in approximately two working days, i.e. should be up on Friday uh, for you to share with friends and colleagues. But the most important thing is please do use the GoToWebinar question and answer facility so that I can feed uh, questions, comments, observations into our expert panel from 1130. Uh, please don't use Signal, email, WhatsApp, uh, all the other various communication devices, because I'm here with you. Um, that if you do feed those questions, comments, and observations in, I will feed them into the, uh, into the discussion. And uh, our panel will get a copy of all of, the, uh, all of these comments with your email attached if you want them to get back to you with some specific items or information. So uh, with no further ado, um, Aralia, the floor is very much yours and your team's. Thank you, Michael. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for listening in. Um, so, I mean, we, you know, technology is a, is a great subject in, in implementing innovative technology is also very complex. Um, and we are very lucky to have um, Gavin Cole and Lee Ashmore, uh, you know, from NatWest and HSBC to come and participate in this discussion. Uh, Michael, if you just uh, want to go into the next slides, um, I can introduce the, the panelists today. Um, so, Gavin, you uh, are an award winning. Uh, customer for your work uh, with uh, with Feature Space and the uh, great innovation you brought in to NetWest uh, by actually winning the Card and Payment Awards this year for Best Fraud uh, Development. Um, and uh, we found it, it would be incredible if you could share you know, your experience today with the audience. Lee, similar thing, uh, you won the Model Risk Management Award with Silent uh, for the transformational work you have done uh, in Asia Pacific. Um, and Kartik, uh, you are uh, leading data science, but also the entire part of delivery for feature space. You're kind of the common denominator here as well. Um, and going to deliveries is not an easy thing, uh, you know. So maybe if I start with you, Gavin, what was um, what was the challenges you kind of encountered and what are the success stories of implementing such a complex technology in a such complex environment and institution? Yeah, so I, I kind of open, <clears throat> openly said that, that um, our, our deployment of ARIC is probably the most complicated, uh, is the most complicated project that uh, we've ever done in terms of fraud prevention, also the biggest investment that we've made. Um, and just incredibly con um, complex to get all of the right data together, the right processes, and the right people. Um, and I think that just, you know, you, you don't ever underestimate what it takes to do something like this. At its peak, we had well over 100 people on our site working on the project, and we had 19 different technology teams involved as well. That just kind of gives a sense of the scale of the, the challenge to coordinate all of that activity. Fantastic. And Lee, 
Um, it was a kind of a first in many ways for, for HSBC and the program we talk, took on board to kind of take it end to end into going live. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience and maybe your key lesson learned? Yeah, sure. Um, so this was really a groundbreaking initiative within HSBC um, for several reasons. So first of all, it was the first use of AI and machine learning for AML detection um, within HSBC that went into production. Um, but also we deployed this on Google Cloud platform as well. So um, the Arik solution was initially designed to be an on-premise solution, um, but we thought that it was a great opportunity um, for us to really kind of try and um, innovate and plan for the future and go for a cloud first approach. Um, that brought with it many significant challenges along the way uh, in terms of the kinds of data that we needed to uh, make available on the cloud, and uh, particularly when you're talking about anti-money laundering, um, you know, you do have highly restricted data um, that, that needs to be made available. And um, so we had, you know, quite a lengthy process to go through in terms of making sure that um, we had all the right approvals in place, we had all the right security um, and, and everything else covered um, before we went live. But it was a great learning experience um, for the team and I, um, and, you know, a really fabulous uh, sense of achievement um, when we went live, um, culminating in a, you know, winning an award, which is always fantastic. I and so in terms of challenges, yeah, yeah. It, it, was, it was great. Um, we had several several challenges, as I said, it you know, on-premise solution, cloud first, first use of AI machine learning, um, some very challenging stakeholders um, within the business, very demanding. Um, so, you know, there were quite a few uh, learning points along the way there. Um, and, you know, a very aggressive time frame as well. So, you know, we wanted to go live as, as quickly as possible. So that was all, all part of the fun. And, and what, how did you overcome those? And I'm sure, Gavin, you've probably seen those as well. But how, from, a, from your perspective, trying to take a complex institutions to, into innovation, um, how did you overcome those challenges? Yeah, so um, several ways. So as I said, we had some very challenging um, business stakeholders. So one of the first challenges was to kind of know your audience um, and, and make sure that you can tailor the messages um, to their specific needs. So, you know, I do recall that when we first suggested going on cloud, um, the initial response was a flat no, because it was deemed to be expensive and take too long, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, when we pointed out that the main reason behind the uh, traditional extended um, amounts of time required for cloud de deployments was really the bureaucracy, um, then this kind of became a challenge for our business stakeholder in order to help us break down that bureaucracy. And, and not only was this an important achievement for the deployment of Feature Space Arik, but actually it helps to set the bank up for um, better success in the future because this, this was all groundbreaking. So we were changing um, the, the process for going onto cloud for HSBC as a whole not just for this project. Um, so the work that we did really kind of helped to make sure that future cloud deployments can be implemented much more smoothly and much more quickly. Um, we had issues around architecture as well. So uh, we actually had to write and design some of the architectural patterns for deploying this kind of solution on cloud because they didn't exist in HSBC. Um, so, you know, this this was a fantastic achievement, knowing that not only were we deploying um, such a groundbreaking solution onto cloud, um, but we were actually helping to smooth the path um, for future cloud deployments across HSBC in the future. I really want to hear from Kartik, but just before that, Gavin, did you have to take people on a journey as well within that West? Yeah, absolutely. Both in a, in a kind of business and technology perspective. I mean, kind of almost our approach was different because we were on-prem, but we we're 
I'd probably mirror a lot of the things that Lee had to go through. Some of the technology stack that um, that Eric uses wasn't used in the bank, and we had to go through adoption processes and um, use of enterprise cloud as well. Kind of mirrored some of the, the kind of challenges uh, in terms of data and and kind of end to end process uh, mapping. So I think that's um, you know that that's particularly the use of some of the software that I mentioned. That that's kind of set the bank up for future deployments as well. Um, so I think it's never easy being on the kind of front end of these sort of bleeding edge technologies, but I think you do make it easier for everybody that follows behind you. Yeah, I know. I mean, Kartek, I was just saying that you are the common denominator between this fantastic collaboration and partnership here. What's your secret recipe? How do you set yourself up and the teams for success to, to bring such complex technology into, as I mentioned, complex institutions? You know, the, the, the secret is really that there's no secret, right? Like, I think the, these deployments are always hard and challenging, right? And I think the thing that's really important to kind of remember is that, you know, the business stakeholders have like a clear idea of like the business benefit that, that you need to bring. And then it's about kind of like both teams, like, you know, vendor and bank teams kind of working together collaboratively to solve problems to deliver that business benefit. And sometimes, maybe you know the the solution we pick is not exactly the one that we started with but it's just about kind of you know kind of building confidence i guess between uh you know client and vendor but also kind of just having this problem solving mentality right to kind of say okay well i understand that this is difficult can we achieve the same goal a slightly different way uh and again like i think lee pointed out really well right like actually i'm a technologist and i kind of tend to think of everything as a technology problem, but actually you kind of realize that in these large complex organizations, there's not, not everything is a technology problem. Some of them are social problems, some of them are problems of bureaucracy, and actually to kind of really view the collection of tools that you have to solve problems available in the broadest possible sense, right? Like I would say that those are two things that are incredibly helpful as you kind of go through these big long journeys. And what would be, what is your biggest lesson learned working with, the, with those institutions? I think, you know, that, that's the biggest thing, right, which is to kind of really have a problem solving mentality, right, which is to kind of really say that I think, you know, <clears throat> certainly it's possible to kind of like get very dogmatic to kind of say, hey, this is what our solution does and like, you know, things like that. But I think a large part of why people kind of like enjoy working with feature space is that you know, we tend to have like this problem solving mentality, which is to kind of say, hey, look, you know, maybe this is something that we did or, you know, didn't do or like isn't in the platform, but actually how do we kind of find a solution that kind of works for all of us and that, you know, kind of like gets the system live and delivering business benefit, right? So I think it also helps that for us, really, we only start getting paid once, like, you know, customers start using the system, right? So, like, we're as incentivized as the bank is to kind of, like, get these systems live and being used, right? So, that's also helpful. And I guess, um, I think you mentioned to me before is you almost set yourself up for disappointment if you think there's no obstacles. And I think that's probably why that problem solving mentality is so important. Absolutely. Right? And I think, you know, again, like, you know, the most important thing is, like, actually, you know these 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 digital transformations these like fraud and risk transformations are like long journeys and i think you need to enter that journey with the right mindset right and i think the right mindset is two of course right hey there will be issues but the other mindset is really i think historically certainly you know the vendor client relationship has been quite antagonistic right in the sense that hey you know like actually so and i think the the thing that's really important like is is the the direction or the 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 direction we give our teams is to kind of think about being on this journey together and kind of like almost melding the two teams, right? Like the client side team and the vendor side team as to be one team kind of delivering value to the bank, right? And then that's where you kind of actually end up kind of having like positive conversations about like so about how do we best go about solving these problems rather than like trying to assign blame, right? Because actually that doesn't help anyone. If you try and assign blame, you have like a broken relationship and you still have the problem, right? So it doesn't help anyone. When you kind Absolutely. Of that. yeah, um, that's important. I, I guess there was also unforeseen risk that came up. Uh, COVID hit the grounds uh, last year. Um, 
I think, Lee, you have to go through that. We did a deployment in two different regions completely. How, how did you manage that? How did you go about it and almost put a, again, solving problem, you know, problem solving cap on? Yeah, so the, the, the pandemic brought many challenges um, across the team. Uh, across the bank as a whole, but across my team. Um, so, you know, for long periods last year, we were all working remotely, uh, which, which brings its own challenges. Um, but I think the, the specific challenge that we faced was really about uh, not being able to have people co-located. So um, our initial deployments were in Hong Kong and Singapore, um, which, you know, thankfully are in the Asia Pacific region, where, which is where my team and I are based, um, or, or certainly the team that was working on this deployment are based. Um, and so that helped being in the same um, time zone um, from that purpose. But, you know, we were not able to collaborate as effectively as we would have liked with um, the feature space team um, due to the pandemic. So, you know, we couldn't have people um, on site working together going through the various kind of challenges uh, in particular um, the, the data challenges that were faced so um, you know data is always um, if not the most critical then certainly one of the most critical parts of any deployment um, and, and when you're looking at implementing a tool such as um, a feature space ARIC then uh, that, that uses machine learning um, then obviously you know data is of the utmost of uh, importance. So I think having the teams being able to um, co-locate and work very closely together on those challenges would have made things much easier. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, that wasn't possible. So the teams um, worked as, as well as they could together, um, changing time zones. I know that the guys in the UK started earlier, um, guys in, in Asia and words a bit later, and just to try and maximize um, the time zones and, and the, the hours that we could collaborate together. So that, that was a real challenge, but um, at the end of the day, you know, it, it was a great success um, and, and the teams learned a lot and collaborated, collaborated um, really well. Yeah, that's great to hear. And I mean, yeah, it was a great experience to be honest and being able to do that in within a year almost, um, that was, um, yeah, a great delivery program. Gavin, if I were to ask you, um, I think we went live just before COVID uh, with NetWest, which was fantastic. If you were to do something differently, what would you do? Um, probably a couple of things. So we we probably bit off quite a lot to chew in one go, uh, right first. So we took on all of faster payments all of um, a commercial and our, our personal uh, digital banking channels and um, you know and then tie that into customer communication systems so that you get automated alerting and things that's quite a lot of scope to deal with one uh, one batch and we also try to you know, the bank's been on a journey still on a journey in terms of ways of working and more agile and devops type deliveries and we didn't completely leave the waterfall methodology behind. We used some of the agile tooling, uh, which was a good thing. I think that was definitely something that, that helped us a lot. So we weren't being, we didn't spend six months on building a business requirements document, for instance. Um, I, I think perhaps with hindsight, I'd maybe narrow the scope a bit more. Uh, it probably put a lot of stress on us for that, that initial delivery. Um, I, and I think probably one of the things um, that, that I would do in the future is maybe just be more aggressive about those delivery methodologies. And now, now we're kind of working in a much more agile way and feature space are part of that as well. They're part of our sort of big big room planning, sort of PI planning sessions and uh, sprint uh, reviews and all that sort of thing as well. So they're very much part of the team as Karthik was, was kind of saying. So it seems like the collaboration doesn't stop at go, go live, it just needs to continue. And that's also part of the journey to make sure things are successful going forward. Yeah, I mean, we've got an absolutely amazing bunch of people that work on it on, on both sides, I would say. Um, and everybody kind of gets on very much in that partnership spirit. Fantastic. And Carty, what about you? If you were to do something differently, what would that be? I think, you know, the one thing that I guess 
you know, like actually as someone who's kind of deploying the system time and time again, uh, it's easy to forget that just because you know your system inside out doesn't mean that your clients understand, right? So, and actually I think there is something about us kind of really kind of helping, you know, our clients and like the, the delivery team, right? Like as it is, uh, to kind of really understand like, you know, how Eric is architected, why we make particular choices so that we can then kind of like go and figure out like how to deliver value better, right? So I think for me, you know, like real time machine learning systems are complex pieces, right? Like actually they are, you know, among the most sophisticated piece of soft, pieces of software technology there is, you have to make some particular choices in order to get like performance and scale and things like that. But actually I think for me, you know, like actually just, just kind of this, common understanding right and like it goes both ways right so like the feature space team kind of really understanding the constraints and the policies and like you know uh what the bank is aiming to do with these systems like uh, what part we're playing in the digital transformation like what the constraints are you know as lee was saying what the social environment is right you know who are the business stakeholders you know who who you know kind of getting a sense for the land to kind of understand who is able to help and like really accelerate some of those social things because i think for me again like i said as a technologist i kind of view tend to view things as technology problems but actually in large complex organizations half the pro only half the problem is technology right and there's a bunch of other problems to solve so i think for me two things right like understanding the system and understanding what we're working with and getting a better understanding of the landscape right like to kind of understand where are we operating who are the stakeholders who are the influencers how do we kind of like make sure that they stay on side and that they kind of like, you know, continue to be a supporter and to kind of remove obstacles for the project, right? So I think for me, those are two big lessons. Lee, can I ask you the same question? What would you yep. do differently? What would I do differently? Um, so I think as well as what I mentioned earlier about, you know, if we could have more kind of closer collaboration, people traveling, that, that would have been great. Unfortunately, we were not able to do that um, due to circumstances outside of our control. Um, but I think one of the kind of the biggest lessons that we've learned um, is around how critical data quality is. Um, so if I look at one, one of the areas where we had the, the, the biggest challenges, it was around um, that data, making sure that it was fit for purpose so that models could be tuned um, properly, et cetera. Um, so I think making sure that we have um, testing data science environments set up with mass production data as soon as possible so that the data scientists can work with that, um, that that's a big learning point for us. Um, but also making sure that you really kind of dig into those data quality issues um, up front and, and try and address them as much as you can. Um, those are really the, the, the two biggest areas um, right now. Um, and I think just to kind of add on to what Karthik said there about knowing your stakeholders. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's something I would have done differently. Um, but I think it's something that I am quite happy about on this implementation in that we did manage to bring a very difficult business stakeholder along on the journey with us. Um, we used him as a secret weapon to break down the bureaucracy um, and, you know, uh, go for a pioneering cloud first approach. Um, I think a lot of teams would have given up. and They wouldn't have done that. They would have just said, you know, okay, that's going to be too difficult. We'll just go with what we know. Um, but I'm really kind of proud that the team um, decided that, you know, they wanted to kind of break new ground here and, and try something different and, and bring along a very senior, um, very awkward um, business stakeholder in the process. Wow, fantastic. You're kind of stealing my next question, actually. I was going to ask Sorry. Gavin. Oh, you're going to add something, but um, please do. And my question to you would be, what are you the most proud of? in these days, right? Yeah, no, I was just saying to Lee, I think we should uh, definitely compare some notes offline about stakeholder <laughs> approaches. Um, in terms of what I'm proud of, I think, you know, I, I think the fact that you make, you make a lot of promises in uh, in these types of deliveries in terms of what, what you're going to get and 
what the investment's going to return. And I think um, I think the fact that we've, we've done what we said we'd do, basically, we, we've kind of delivered, probably actually, you know, in terms of an investment, um, you know, exceeded some of the benchmarks we set for ourselves. Um, you know, we went live last March with, with just rules. Um, I think over 150 kind of rules with the model going in at the end of the year, we've cut that down to, I think about 35 or so. So, you know, we really see the, the actual data science, the, the kind of machine learning really take off and prove that it's doing what we said it would do. And I think that's, that's just the ultimate in terms of delivery. Fantastic to hear. Um, Lee, is there anything else you wanted to add or what, what, what else are you yeah. very proud of? Um, so I, I guess, um, one more thing that I'm really proud of is that we did take the opportunity here to really go full blown DevOps and we implemented um, full automation on our pipeline. So we've got um, full CI CD, um, which uh, is a challenge uh, on, on cloud, um, although cloud is supposed to make it easy for you. Um, but basically we, we did this so that we can uh, basically spend more time on other value-added business functions rather than worrying about the infrastructure all the time. So, um, it, you know, this was a great success. W within HSBC, we call it our cattle service model, um, which is basically whereby um, we deploy infrastructure as code programmatically. Um, and this, um, together with using cloud as infrastructure as a service, um, reduces the effort and time uh, that's required for the operating system and hardware upgrades. Um, so this this was you know something that I'm really proud of, uh, as well as the other things that I mentioned. Well, thank you both of you, Kartik. I'm going to ask you the question as well because it was a long journey on two fantastic partnerships. So what about you? I think for me, really, the results that we delivered were absolutely stellar, right? So like I think you know, if I may, I, I well. I, 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 well, okay, I, I should be careful about what, what I say about like numbers and things like that. But I, I think for me, you know, delivering like significant uplifts, right? Like in terms of uh, de detection, like both in terms of frauds and scams for, for NetWest, I think, uh, again, it kind of really reinforces uh, certainly, you know, the thing that like we want to be known for, right? Analytic leadership. Uh, and actually, again, like it's really nice to be recognized Actually, it's really nice for our customers to be recognized for the outstanding work that we're doing together, right? So I think for me, uh, and even on the uh, HSBC side, you know, to kind of have, you know, a, a good reduction in the volume of like, you know, useless alerts, things like that, like while kind of maintaining the coverage. I think, again, you know, it's, you, you know that this is a long journey, but you so, but actually the results at the end of it, you kind of look at them, you know, like, well, yeah, okay, fine. You know, we actually delivered what we said we would do uh, and more, right? And so actually, I think for me, not just for me, right? But actually for the teams involved, they kind of really look at what they've done and they're very proud to kind of say, I mean, hey, you know, it was a, it was a, it was hard. It was a long, hard journey, but like, you know, what boy, was it worth it, right? Like actually the results are absolutely outstanding. And in fact, not just outstanding, but award-winning outstanding, right? Which is just really nice for like, both both sides to kind of be involved in. And was it like being able to promise things, but almost under promise and over deliver was a great success for us, isn't it? Right, yeah, absolutely, right? So I think uh, kind of over delivering on the promises that were made is well, great, right? Like actually that's exactly where we want to be. Fantastic, well, I think it's probably time for Q&A. So Michael, should I hand over back to you? Um, that would be great and a really fantastic discussion and, and very well moderated, Arlie. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank yeah, you. we've got a few questions here and folks, uh, please do send in more. Uh, there, there's a sufficient time to address quite a, quite a number, I think. Uh, first one I'd like to, to kick off with is from Hugh Purser. Uh, he says the, the discussion is focused on implementation from the client's point of view. But what about the interface with external regulatory requirements? especially since the projects we've been talking about are AML and compliance. Lee, do you want to take that one? Um, I'm trying to think of the answer. So I think looking at this from a technical perspective, um, then the biggest challenges from a regulatory point of view that we had were really around the type of data um, that we were looking to put onto cloud 
Um, we actually found that the regulators, so the HKMA and MAS, um, were actually very supportive. Um, so actually what we tend to find is that the biggest problem is not the regulator, um, it's actually the internal bureaucracy um, that's the problem. Um, so from a regulatory point of view, we, we didn't actually face any real challenges in, in terms of implementing this solution. Um, it was all about the internal processes and that was really all about making sure that um, the data that you are putting onto cloud is uh, accurately assessed in terms of the risk of that data um, and also that it's secure. So, you know, the cyber reviews were very stringent um, because clearly we don't want any of this kind of data um, leaking out um, into the public. Um, but other than that, it was it was actually not really an issue at all from a regulatory perspective. Gavin, was that also your experience? Yeah, so generally in regulation, there's, there's more in the AML space anyway. I think the only thing that we probably touch on is that there, there's a need to be more transparent when you're using machine learning now and going through that kind of moral risk assessment. It was a relatively new process in the bank and uh, first time through it was, uh, I, I can sure I can speak for the people that I tried to manage that, but challenging to say the least, I think, to be able to kind of prove that, that, um, that transparency. Okay. Uh, Ian from West London has done a number of uh, machine learning projects, quite a few actually, over uh, a couple of decades, and he appreciates your, your comments here about the importance of data and the data integrity and the data quality, um, but it's also a moving feast. You know, new data is coming in that needs to be added to the model, um, and you know, how close can you get to real time is his first question, uh, and secondly, do you have any pointers on managing that data quality as you as you're rolling going forward and updating your machine learning tools well, I would say where, where possible we've always gone for golden source and that doesn't necessarily mean it's of great quality but it's probably the, the best that you can get um, you know there are other teams across the bank that are looking at data quality as a you know as a standalone issue um, I, I, I don't think there's there's probably much more you can really do other than uh, when you when you separate the the kind of risk side of things from from the data then you, you've got to rely on that. I think the other thing as well is that you know you, then also kind of relying on the platform right that you're kind of like sending data into to be able to have. Uh, you know, tooling around like data monitoring, like, you know, model monitoring and things like that. And actually, I think, you know, that's an area where we have some offerings, but like actually we're kind of like really aggressively investing in kind of like, you know, filling that, you know, what in modern parlance is called ML operations, right? But actually has existed as long as machine learning systems have, right? You know, uh, if, yeah, you, you know, you, you historically have tended to find, hey, you know, like my model is not performing very well. And then you kind of like dig in and you kind of find that, you know, you haven't been sent any fraud labels for like months and months and months and things like that. But I think what's helpful is that, you know, the, the models and the analytics are used on a regular basis. And actually, so you kind of, when you kind of look at metrics about like how the analytics are performing, what the quality of each of the rules are, what, what your scam cash rate is, what your payaway rates are, things like that, uh, then actually you, you then have like, you know, a really good set of metrics on like what the outcomes from your system are. All right, and actually like if you kind of like trend, you, if they're trending flat or if they're trending like, you know, uh, relatively well, then actually you know well the, there's there's a pretty good chance that like the underlying data is, is is starting to be good, and then of course we also have like data in the system. We have kind of have dashboards kind of saying here are the failed events, here are the events that like you know didn't pass validation, like all of those kinds of things. I think for me, some of it is like a process and an organizational solution. You need to have someone to kind of look at these metrics, and some of this is a technological solution where you kind of have the ability to kind of like capture things that are important to your system on an ongoing basis, right? I would say. Okay. Uh, Mark Cook has a few questions and we'll need to be, I think, a bit pointed, but uh, he'd like some quick pointers on who provides the data science capability 
who owns the models and are there any important GDPR considerations? I'll just repeat that. Who provides the data science capability? Who owns the models and are there GDPR considerations? So I think, uh, so, so Lee, you were about to say, go on. Sorry, Lee, did you? Well, do you want me to answer while Lee's struggling with this? Yeah. Is okay. Thanks, Gavin. So, um, well, part of the reason that we chose uh, feature space is that we wanted to be able to blend in-house data science with their models. So, you know, we, we've kind of skilled up in that area as well. And I think I see a future of, you know, us being able to build models, say, around things like customer vulnerability and using the output of that within ARIC as well. Um, but as far as where we stand right now in terms of that payment profiling, we're, we're using feature spaces data science. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Lee, you, you, your mic's back on, I think. Yeah, I'm back now. Sorry, my, my system hung for a few seconds there. Yeah, so did you have some comments on uh, the data science capability and model ownership? Yeah, so um, for this implementation, we, we did use the uh, feature space um, data scientists as well. Uh, in terms of model ownership, um, we do have internal model governance within HSBC and, and the models had to um, go through and be approved um, by those model owners within HSBC. Okay. Um, Antonis uh, Antonakos has got a question which frequently comes up in, in these sorts of situations about uh, machine learning applications and that's really the the, the ML rule explainability. Um, how easy is it for users to work with alerts generated from machine learning models? So I think, like any change, right? It kind of takes, uh, you know, you, you need to take your users on a journey, right? To kind of say, okay, well, you know, if you're used to seeing, hey, you know, this rule fired, therefore you look at you look at these things uh then you know uh then like that's easy and they're used to working a particular way uh so i think you know we've kind of pre gavin do we have reason codes for your like payments models at network yeah. I, I was going to say obviously that the back end of Eric is quite highly configurable and we've, we've kind of done that in such a way as so that the operators can kind of explain to the customer why that that alert has been raised and that that generates the conversation really around that Okay. Um, Hugh Purser again is, uh, I think he's after a little bit of color really. Um, is the machine learning process throwing up behavioral differences between, for example, Asian bank clients and European bank clients in AML? What sort of insights are you gaining that you might not have gathered? How, how would you almost know it's a machine learning application as opposed to programmed? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Karthik, go ahead. No, no, I, I think that's a really interesting question, right? So and I think for me, the, the difference between like, you know, what you, you'd consider machine learning and like, you know, consider like based on rules is that I think generally with rules that were written by a human, they're also understandable by a human, right? You say if this happened and that happened, some, then that, something like that happened. Whereas actually typically what you find with machine learning classifiers is you kind of get like aggregations of tons of tiny little signals, right? That kind of like then add up to kind of being something like much more risky, right? So I think for me, you know, the how do you know it's a machine learning model? I, I guess like so for, certainly for NatWest, I think, you know, we kind of went live as Gavin said with like 150 rules. We added a model on top and then we kind of, took away like a bunch of those rules because it, it turned out that the model was very effective at finding fraud, right? So I think a lot of the new rules kind of then rely on a model score plus some fraud strategy on top, right? So I would kind of say that, you know, look, I, you know, a sufficiently complicated rule system is, you know, equivalent to a machine learning model, but like you, you wouldn't want to write or maintain something like that. You'd much rather have it like kind of learn from data, right? And I guess, Gavin Lee, if there's any other further detail to add on that, I think I'd be grateful. Yeah, obviously one of the big advantages with machine learning is that it, it spots when there's something new, um, where there's a, there's a deviation and, and then starts to learn from that immediately. Uh, that's one of the advantages rather than have to 
the analytics and you know you've discovered you've got a problem and then you're trying to work back to see what the real solution would be for that. Uh, Gavin, in your presentation, you mentioned benchmarks uh, and 50 benchmarks. Could you get uh, some folks would just like maybe some examples of what, what you meant by that? So, <clears throat> and these are just basically the metrics that we use to, to kind of measure the performance, things like uh, the value detection rates, false positives, that kind of thing. Okay, um, very, very helpful. Those were what I had to use to, to kind of make the original investment case. Hmm. Um, Lee, um, you, you spoke a few times about the, the challenges of not being co-located, um, but a lot of people might say that the new normal is going to be uh, widespread teams and perhaps even wider in that we're looking at a world where we might be uh, having to employ the best machine learning specialists regardless of where they are and you know, not their commutability to a particular location. Um, do you, do you have any thoughts? What, what have you learned about managing a remote team over the last uh, 14 months or whatever. Uh, Lee seems to have frozen uh, there. So I'll just, uh, while he's uh, coming back on that one, I'll just move to another question really. Um, Karthik, you mentioned um, the client vendor relationship and trying to ensure, in fact, the, the um, <laughs> the blame game is not a good game to play, which I can completely agree with. But what structures would you recommend as a vendor uh, to control you, particularly like regular reporting and things like that? Uh, I think, you know, the, the, the really important things are kind of, I guess, you know, you know, when we're kind of talking about regular reporting or things like that, I think the much more important thing is to kind of really understand what in what's important to your stakeholders right to kind of understand like you know how, how you kind of like you know report progress and i think you know like lee and gavin have already called out like actually you know people always like stakeholders like business stakeholders always vastly underestimate how complex the the understanding the data universe and kind of like making sure that like you know you kind of know exactly what data you're ingesting and what data you're going to be decisioning on so actually, I would kind of say that, like, kind of involving them in the process, right? Kind of, you know, playing back. Yeah, here are the things that we found. Here are the things that we've we've kind of found that, you know, you may not have known, right? So kind of bringing them along the journey, like, of how difficult this stuff is and why it's difficult, uh, I think is, is is really helpful. And then again, like, I think the other thing as well is that, you know, in in any relationship, right? Actually, particularly one where, you know, so. It, Trust is so important, right? So then it's about kind of like really making sure that you kind of set yourself up to succeed right early on. You kind of like make small promises, you keep them, and then you make bigger promises and you keep them too, right? So I think actually it's then about kind of figuring out like how best you kind of do that, right? So it's not necessarily about tangible outputs, right? Like actually good relationships are founded on trust. Right. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, then it, it's much more about kind of winning trust and winning trust is so situation dependent. It depends on like what your stakeholder cares about and then, you know, figuring out like how to deliver against that. Right. I guess is, is the important thing. And if you kind of deliver early wins up front, right, as a joint team, right, it's mm -hmm. not just like one rather than another. I think that kind of really helps and sets you up, sets you up for success later on. Okay. Well, we're running short of time and uh, uh, some thanks are coming in, but uh, what I'd like to do is just squeeze one last question. Ali, just uh, just there, we, we were speaking, uh, you spoke uh, quite eloquently, I thought about the challenges of co-location, but in the world that's um, emerging, we're, we're certainly going to be seeing teams, uh, perhaps the new normal is in fact widespread teams. And uh, as I was saying uh, earlier, that people are going to expect you to hire the best individuals in the world, regardless of their location. So it's not their commutability to a center in Hong Kong or a center in London or a center in Edinburgh or anything. Um, what have you learned over the last 14 months? You know, a couple of good tricks on how to manage uh, dispersed teams. Yeah, no, great question. And so I'm, I'm, I'm quite fortunate in the sense that um, I, I do have a very globally dispersed team. Um, so our, my team is spread across Hong Kong, China, India, um, the UK, the US, 
Mexico and Argentina, uh, with some people in Canada as well. So it, it really spreads the whole globe, uh, which means my work-life balance is terrible, um, <laughs> being based in Asia. But um, but yeah, I've learned a lot over the last 14 months about how to make it work. Now, what I found is um, it is really, you know, Zoom fatigue is real. Um, I've experienced it myself. Um, there's been times when I've been on Zoom all day and then suddenly it's as if somebody's just unplugged the cord, the power cord out of the back of me and I, I just need to recharge. So I think, you know, make sure that you you take time out for yourself to recharge your batteries. But in terms of working with the wider team, I guess it's it's really kind of trying to understand and realize that everybody handles this differently. So there are some people who really enjoy working from home. So for them, it's great that they get to stay with their, their husband or wife um, or spend time with the kids all day. And, you know, they're, they're really happy about working from home. There are others, um, you know, mainly the extroverts amongst us who, who hate it. You know, they can't stand being stuck at home without access to people. Um, so I found that making sure that you schedule lots of informal time um, with your teams is a good way um to kind of help them so you know make sure that you have zooms with them where you talk about things other than work check you know check on them to how are they um and and maybe have a virtual drink together something like that um i've also found that kind of virtual team events work quite well as well where you can get people from across the globe and just kind of have a bit of a, a chit chat and just try to keep that sense of belonging um i think the last 14 months have shown us that it is possible um to work remotely um whether it will be uh, i i guess something that that you know everybody wants to do i'm not so sure about that um but certainly i think we've learned a lot over the last year or so that you know we can work remotely it does work um and and the, the most important thing is having the right people and, and looking after your people as well making sure that they're okay okay well I'm sorry long answer no, it's great. I, I think this is a time we're all learning. And in fact, what was really delightful uh, in today's conversation was having a vendor uh, with two clients and sharing those experiences. Uh, Mark uh, Cook actually says, you know, interesting presentation. Very good to hear from two clients. And I think this kind of decompression of large projects is always helpful. Um, I need to close, though, and I'm just going to give three quick rounds of thanks, if I may. Uh, firstly, again, to our sponsors for their tolerance and allowing us to range widely and freely, but I suspect that they found this very helpful. Um, I would also like to thank the audience. It's always good to get your comments and questions in. Uh, as you gather, we've uh, got many forthcoming events. Best thing to do is uh, just to check out uh, the website. Uh, finally, if I may, um, I would like to thank the panel. Uh, Aralia, you know, extremely well moderated. Uh, Gavin Lee and Karthik, uh, some really great insights. Unfortunately, in this age of uh, remote working, et cetera, I can't give you any remote applause. So I have a little applause device here. This is my Korean karmic clapper, uh, which is a sustainable uh, device uh, for applause. And I'd like to thank you all for coming and sharing your experiences. And we hope to learn more uh, with you in the years to come. Thank you.